white readers are quick to tear those books and those authors to shreds. This book did not age well because you have thrillers that talk about these same kind of themes by white authors that are not getting thrown away. What up my channel? Welcome back to another video and on today's episode in Race Trader, I am going to be talking about problematic books written by black authors. I wanted to make this video for several reasons, the top being that the way problematic black authors are treated in the book community often frustrates me. So often black authors are not given the amount of leeway and second, third, even fourth chances that non-black authors are, especially very popular white authors. And so it's really important for me to see more well-rounded conversations surrounding black authors. I hate this idea that when you are marginalized because you come from a marginalized group, it means that you're perfect and incapable of sin. Because if you think about it, that is incredibly dehumanizing. I want to embrace black authors in all of their very human nuance. And that means talking about when they make mistakes and challenging harmful narratives within their works. Because binaristic views of any social group is incredibly unhelpful, both for those outside of the group, but more importantly for those inside the group as well. In this video I'm going to be talking about some fairly popular books written by black authors that I personally saw some issues with. Out of this entire list that I'm about to present, there are only two books that I completely do not recommend. The other books are ones that I still recommend, but I want to give caveats. I want to say, hey, read these books, but know these issues going into them. I'm really interested in having nuanced conversation about problematic works by BIPOC authors. And instead of throwing these books and throwing these authors away, let's bring them into the conversation, acknowledge that these authors deserve the space to make their mistakes and correct those mistakes in their later works. So the first book we're going to be starting with is Rise to the Sun by Leah Johnson. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there's like four or five of these books that I just wholly wouldn't recommend. And honestly, this is one of them. I am so nervous to talk about this book because it is a black sapphic book by an author that I actually quite like. I think that Leah Johnson is an amazing person and an amazing writer. I was going into this book just absolutely so geeked and so excited. I loved You Should See Me in a Crown. That is a book by her that I just wholeheartedly recommend all over the place. But Rise to the Sun is not one of those books. I started this book tapping the absolute shit out of it. Like you can see how intensely I was tapping it. And then things took a turn. I didn't want to annotate it anymore. I just was so absolutely turned off by where the story went. And so we are following two black girls who are very, very different. One of them is basically addicted to love and needs a lot of external validation. And the other one is a musician who is quite shy and quite reserved. She's still grieving the loss of her father. And these two Two girls encounter one another at this festival where they're competing in this scavenger hunt and they fall in love over the course of like 36 hours. Now the reason that I found this book to be very problematic isn't because I think that there's something wrong with being a teenager and saying I love you within 24 hours. I think many of us have been there, many of us can relate to that and sometimes we just want to suspend our disbelief especially as youths and believe that you can find your soulmate with in 24 hours and I'm not even saying that that's entirely impossible. The reason that I had issues with it is because I cannot remember her name but the girl who is addicted to love is healing from trauma that was witnessed by a lot of people. She is healing from this awful sexual assault, sexual harassment that she experienced. Also trying to manage the fact that she does not feel loved and valuable without external validation from a partner. What really frustrated me about this novel is the way that that issue, which is psychological, was handled. Therapy was not pushed for this girl and she talked a lot about how she just jumps in and out of relationships and is a serial monogamous. And there's a lot of self work that needs to happen in order to work on that. And the solution to that problem, that pathological issue was basically, well, just fall in love with this girl in 24 hours and then work hard on that relationship. And I think what would have been healthier in this case is if 
the at the end of the book this girl said you know what let's move slow let me go to therapy let me work on this issue instead of jumping into another relationship i was very very frustrated about it because this would have been a great opportunity to depict black a black girl going into therapy so often within the black community we are not talking about the hypersexualization of black girls we're not talking about the way that the throwing away of black girls and the way that black women are under depicted as beautiful in our society leads to things like hypersexualization addiction to love addiction to sex and to intimacy and those are issues that need therapy and i was so honestly i was offended by how it was handled that the solution was just like we'll find somebody who really really loves you these other guys don't matter it really irritated me and i found it very very problematic Next up, we are going to be talking about The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, which is a book that I actually do not recommend. This is the first and only book that I did a book diary for. I think I also did it for On The Come Up. And I am such a very different person politically and just self-wise than I was when I filmed that video. So I'm going to leave that link down below because when I read this book at the time years ago, I was like, wow, this is like the best book for talking about race for young teens ever written. I was definitely obsessed with it. I was very touched by it. But years later, I have to admit that this book did not age well. Now, Jonathan of To Be Black and Loved, who is one of my favorite booktubers, has an incredible video and it's only nine minutes long talking about the issues with The Hate You Give through a black lens and he does such an incredible job. So that is gonna be linked down below. Please watch that video, please check out his channel because he is so amazing. He doesn't upload all the time, but when he does, they are absolutely unmissable videos, videos that a lot of love and care and thought goes into and I just think that he's so wonderful and deserves way more love. Now, the problem with The Hate You Give is that it promotes the looting narrative and the idea that these black boys and black men who are involved in illegal activities require an obscene amount of humanization in order to acknowledge that their deaths were wrong. Instead of really going into length with this, I would honestly much prefer y'all watch Jonathan's video because I think getting a black male perspective on why this book is problematic and didn't age well is so important. But I'm just gonna say the looting narrative is so tired and so exhausted and the amount of time that was spent and of trying to depict this as a both sides issue instead of something that is systemic, I just, there's, no. I do not recommend this book. I think that there are so many other very fantastic YA books that talk about race and police violence than this one. I'm not saying that what it did for black communities wasn't important, what it did for the conversation wasn't necessary, but I think that this is very much a stepping stone. This also is a book that feels incredibly written for white people. And I'm not saying that it was. I know that Angie Thomas very intentionally, very specifically writes for black audiences and I love that about her. I really like her as an author, like as a person, but I really do feel like this book just reads like Social Justice 101 and spends a lot of time explaining politics to like white readers that black readers, many of us already know going in. And so it just felt like the thesis of the book was trying to convince white people that these issues affecting black kids are real. I don't know if that makes sense. And again, that's just my perspective on the novel. If you are black and read this and have a different experience, different perspective, I would love to hear it down below because again, this video is all about having conversation and having nuance and I never want to depict the black community as something that is monolithic because what makes us so fucking beautiful is that we don't all see things the same way. Next up, I am going to be talking about the wedding date. You're probably wondering how you got here. Can we play later? I'm kind of busy. 
I'm trying to put food in your bowl right now. And you out here fucking up. Do you, can you say box on the side of the road? Can you say animal shelter? Take this with you. Fuck, I shouldn't have thrown that. She's gonna bring it back. The next book that I'd like to talk about is The Wedding Date. This is a very famous, beloved book by a black female romance author who is just absolutely everywhere. And I love seeing a black female romance author just dominating in the book sales and New York Times bestseller list. Like, I love that for her. But unfortunately, this is the first and only book I read by her because I was like, this author is just absolutely not for me. The Wedding Date has so many issues that I just don't understand how nobody is talking about them. Like when it came out, I felt like I was in the Twilight Zone because none of the reviewers that I had happened to watch mentioned the issues that I'm about to mention. And so I was like, is it me? Am I bugging? Am I tripping? First of all, let's talk about Drew. Fuck Drew. Honestly, like, are we not gonna talk about Drew's racism? Because he would make these racist comments, but by the end of the novel, he had never really sat and acknowledged his racism. It, it just didn't sit well with me. The, mm, it felt like it was just thrown in there to add a little bit of contention in their relationship, but it wasn't actually dealt with and handled. It is so important to have dialogue and conversation about what it means to be black and in a relationship with a white person and what it means to be black and trying to talk to your white partner about race, especially in a romance novel and I'm not saying that all black romance novels have to do it because black authors deserve to get to just write a book about interracial relationships and not have to talk about those dynamics if they don't want to if they just want it to be fun and fluff and sexy fun I love that I ship it but if you are going to put those conversations in the book then handle it well follow through and I just didn't feel that his racism was confronted at all within the text. The other major issue that I had within the book was the way that the BDSM sex scenes were handled and issues of consent. They're kissing and Drew at one point, I think he grabs her by the neck and like slams her up against the wall. And you know, she was into it, which I love, I love that. I know that conversations about consent um, aren't necessarily glamorous, but I think that they are, to me, I find that glamorous. Like. But that's just me personally. I think that that is important and necessary and non-negotiable. The message that the book was unintentionally sending was that it is okay for one partner to, you know, grab their partner really aggressively, choke, slap, you know, do these kinds of things without checking in with them beforehand about their boundaries. And, and you know what? Sometimes that doesn't happen. And but at the very least, there should have been a conversation at the end like, yo, I'm so sorry I didn't ask for consent about these things in your comfort level. Let me check in with you. Are you okay with what I did? There just was absolutely none of that. And personally, I am not comfortable ever recommending any kind of romance book where consent is handled so badly. Now we have to talk about one of my personal favorite books. And this again is where the conversation about black people writing problematic books without tossing them away entirely really matters because this is a very, very sensitive subject and we are going to be talking about Light Seekers by Femi Coyote. This was one of my most anticipated releases, I think two years ago, and I read it. It was sent to me by a subscriber off my wish list who was Lena, I absolutely love Lena. Oh my God, Jesse, congratulations on 30K. Now that I'm at 37, I'm just like, oh. I totally passed out during your live because I'm old, I'm sorry. I hope you enjoy the book. And it just means so lot that Lena sent this, so thank you. But I can't remember where I was going because I got all excited. I'm just gonna get into the synopsis. So The Light Seekers is by a nice Nigerian author and in it we are following Dr. Philip Taiwo who is called on by a powerful Nigerian politician to investigate the murders of three students. These students were uh, put into a rubber tire and then covered in gasoline and set on fire. I'm so sorry that that rhymed, that was not intentional. And he's an investigative psychologist and so what he's doing is going around to the residents within the neighborhood, the city, the area, and investigating why this happened. Not trying to find out who did it, but what caused the situation? What caused this mob, because it was a mob, to murder these young black kids in broad daylight? And in real life. Femi Coyote is a psychologist, I believe, clinical psychologist in Nigeria before starting a career in advertising.
This book did so many things well. Talking about politics surrounding Nigerian students and justice, things that Western readers of thrillers need to be acknowledging. Unfortunately, the book community has this hyper focus on Western thrillers and I often wish I saw more support for thrillers that were non-Western. And I think that this is such an amazing book. I loved so much about the book. I loved the investigation process. I loved the psychology within the book. I loved the issues represented. I loved that it wasn't set in the West. Like, I just loved absolutely everything about this book. The writing was great. It, the plotting was fantastic. The pacing was well done. It was painstakingly researched, all of that. However, the plot twist is about mental illness. Let me rephrase, there's a lot of plot twists in this book, but one of the plot twists involved, involves mental illness. And my personal kind of stance is I just don't recommend books that have mental illness as a plot twist for so many reasons. I don't really think I need to get into them. I've spoken about that many, many times on my channel. And that is why I've never actually reviewed this book on my channel before now, because I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to rectify the fact that this book has very important, unmissable dialogue, especially within thrillers, that I just haven't seen done by any other author. With the fact that it has a plot twist that is problematic, because I don't want to throw the whole book away, especially because you have thrillers that talk about these same kind of themes by white authors that are not getting thrown away. Let's talk about The Silent Patient, for example. We aren't throwing that book away. If I were to talk about the fact that this book has mental illness as a plot twist, white readers, especially white thriller readers, would be very quick to just discard this author in this book. If you do choose to read this, and I honestly hope that you do, be aware that the ending can be seen as problematic. Here's the reason why the ending wasn't problematic for me. This is something that's very personal to me and I don't want to get into detail about it. What I will say was that the ending of this book I thought was so well done and in terms of mental illness as a plot twist. It did not feel like a plot device. It, it wasn't done in a way that was done for shock value or just a reveal. It was incredibly well done and at the end of it I was like, is this person an actual psychologist? And sure enough, he is. He actually knows what he's talking about and I personally felt very seen by the plot twist. For this kind of mental illness, it was the best depiction I've ever seen in a book. And so personally, I loved it. I spoke about this with my mother. She lives with DID and absolutely loved the depiction of it as well. I feel like I'm not explaining all of this very well. I hope that it kind of makes a modicum of sense, but y'all make up your own minds. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think of this especially. I just, I would love to know. I also do want to say that the whole mental illness as a plot device, that kind of thing, white authors and white writers in Hollywood kind of have the market on that. Being that incorporated into the story from a Nigerian lens, I think did something different for me, but let's discuss down below, especially if you are black, West African, Nigerian. I would especially love to hear from you because what I don't want to see in the comment section down below is a bunch of white readers just shredding this book without acknowledging all of the other factors that went into play with it, especially considering that this is his field. And knowing that people who live with the ID didn't take issues with this book. But also that doesn't mean that not everybody who is black living with the ID did not take issues with this book. You see what I mean by nuance. All right, we are nearing the end of this video and the next book is one that I have spoken about off and on on my channel and that is Rage of Dragons. So if you are kind of familiar with what I've been doing on my channel, I have this series called Books That I Love But Can't Ethically Recommend. There's two videos out in the series so far and this was a book that I talked about in the latest episode. So that series is gonna be linked down below. Thank you so much those of you who have seen it and been supporting it because it's doing better than I thought it would. I wasn't expecting people to love that series so fucking much. But this is a, bit, a book that I have recently spoken about. It is a West African dragon narrative. It's like a revenge story about this young boy named Tao and we're following him when his father is slain before his eyes and he kind of goes into this military academy in order to um, become like the greatest fighter ever so that he can defeat the guy who just devastated his daddy. Uh, like it was not a fun death. And throughout that there's dragons, there is demons, and it's 
really, really good. The reason why I was very much turned off by this book, the reason why I gave it three stars, the reason that you won't see me recommending it is because I hated the sexism in this book. The sexism was just, it was everywhere. It was so inexcusable. The using rape as a plot device in order to shock the reader, it just, everything. Everything about the way women were handled in the story was atrocious, honestly. But here's my caveat to this. I often see non-black readers shredding this book for the sexism and then praising authors like Patrick Rothfuss for Name of the Wind, which also is a book that I love but can't re ethically recommend because of the sexism. I see white fantasy readers so often just raving about books by sexist white authors that are in fantasy but shredding this one. And so, look, this is what I'm just trying to say. Keep it 100. If you're gonna shred Rage of Dragons, I don't wanna hear you boosting Name of the Wind and ignoring all of these other white, famous male authors in fantasy who have been writing sexist ass works for decades, but you're gonna jump on the back of this black debut author. I don't like it. It's disgusting to me. So that is my caveat. If you do choose to read this, know it going in. I really liked the world building. There was so much about the book that I liked, but the sexism was just, it was a no for me, dog. Next up, we're gonna talk about the only book on this list that I haven't read. And this is a book that I fully intend on reading. And that is Fledgling by Octavia Butler. So I especially would love to hear some critique and feedback from people who have read this in the chat, especially, you know, black horror readers and black readers of paranormal fiction, because my understanding of this book is that it's a vampire narrative and there is a vampire who is like a hundred years old who starts a sexual relationship with another very old vampire who is in the body of a child and often with these 90s you know early 2000s but especially 90s vampiric stories such as uh, the interview with a vampire series written by Anne Rice you see a lot of these like homoerotic themes and you also see themes that just are honestly pedophilic. That is very, very common, not just in Octavia Butler's works, but in Anne Rice's works. And in my opinion, to my knowledge, she is the most prolific vampire writer like of our modern generation. Stephanie Meyer does not fucking count, okay? I think even in Twilight though, there is this hyper glamorization almost to an uncomfortable amount to Renee Esme, the child of Edward and Bella. And then I think in the Voltura, Voltaire, what, Voltaire, that Italian vampire cathedral old order, there is also someone with a child body who is just like, again, just described in terminology that is a little bit too worshipy for me personally. So I just wanna reiterate that Octavia Butler did not start this trend at all. But readers have, modern readers, have been like, yeah, this is not aging well. This book didn't age well. I don't wanna read about this 100-year-old man in relationship with someone who has a child's body. This is something that I've always kind of wondered about, even when I was a kid, because what does it mean for Edward Cullen, for example, to be 116 years old in a 17-year-old's body, but dating a 17-year-old human girl? That's creepy as fuck too, because even though he has the body of a 17-year-old He's 116, you know what I'm saying? And I've had some readers be like, oh, well his development stopped at age 17. And I'm like, you can't tell me that. He's learning all these languages, he's gaining all of this experience, but you're gonna tell me his brain is still 17? Okay, bitch, get the fuck out of here with that shit. I would love to have dialogue about Fledgling by Octavia Butler, The Ancient Nine by Ian something. This is a dark academia book that absolutely sucked. And I'm not even gonna get into it because I have a whole video but basically my issues with the ancient nine was the disgusting transphobia there is a scene where they are at a nightclub the main character and his buddy and they kiss these two women that they don't realize are trans and as a result they decide to harass publicly out those women tear off their wigs wave the wig around humiliate them them in public there are slurs within this book that are just not okay the sexism in this book was absolutely disgusting the way women were treated was so sick you had a lot 
lot of critique of how black people were treated within the secret order little fraternity club that the main character was trying to get into but he also chose to just completely ignore the sexism that was there that was absolutely disgusting and his life's mission after working really hard to expose the racism and the oppression and the bullying and the crimes of this ancient white order that has worked so hard to oppress anybody who is not white and cis and male. After all of that, he makes it his life mission to make sure that his son can join that order one day. Everything about this book, the messaging, the character work, all of it, it was very problematic. And this is a book by an author I will never ever read again. And there is in no way, shape, or form going to be a recommendation of this book coming from me. I forgot to mention Cinderella Isn't Dead by Kaylin Barron. This was a book that I was so excited about, this queer, sapphic Cinderella retelling. It is supposed to be like anti-patriarchy and all of the fun things. Like I was so excited. I love black fairy tale retellings. However, I was very disappointed about how anti-closeted queers this book was and the way that the main character shamed her love interest for not being comfortable coming out of the closet. She made her feel like she was weak and just unwilling to take a stand and just had no empathy for the fact that this girl would have lost her entire family, her family's income, like all of that. And I just thought it was absolutely exhausting. The same issue was in the passing playbook. The other queer love interest was treated as inferior for not wanting to come out and not being comfortable, not feeling safe to come out. In that case, he was the son of a minister or a pastor and he just like knew his father wouldn't accept him and he would have been he would have lost his entire family and the main character had no empathy no sympathy for that and it wasn't in both of these books that those issues were not written in a way that showed that they were wrong they were written in a way to make it seem like the protagonist was right to feel this way so those narratives just were absolutely not i have a video talking about problematic ways that queer authors have depicted closeted characters so that'll be linked down below if you want to check that out however these are both authors that i'm really excited to read from in the future just because i'm excited about that doesn't mean i'm not going to talk about the issues that i saw in their work for example the poison heart by kaylin barron which is her latest work i believe that book is supposed to be incredible people that i really love and trust have been raving about that book and i'm so excited to get my hands on it and finally, we have books that are labeled as problematic by black authors that I personally argue against that point completely. The books that I'm about to talk about, I do not think are problematic in the slightest. And often the criticism of them as problematic, I find to be insensitive, dismissive, and low-key racist. And the books that I'm going to be talking about are Luster by Raven Leilani, Happily Ever Afters by Elise Bryant, I love her, and Queenie by Candace Carty Williams. Also is Felix Ever After by Casey Collender. All of those books, five out of five stars. All of them books that I will defend to my actual grave. Before I kind of launch into the reasons why these books are seen as problematic, I want to read this post that was written, I think yesterday, by an Instagrammer whose name is Pam Subi. Okay, but people saying they didn't like the cheating and luster. How do we problematize that further by also thinking that the vulnerable position working class black women are often forced into? To cleanse this book of the lens of race and state, discomfort ignores the whole unhinged morally gray trend in literature right now with Myrar being at the forefront. That also completely only features cis white women. Like who gets to be messy y'all? And exactly, you have these books that are written by white women with messy, morally gray characters. Let's look at Evelyn Hugo, for example. Evelyn Hugo is celebrated. She is adored for her moral ambiguity. And yes, I know that she's Cuban. Don't get me started on that representation because we'll be here all day. She is praised for her messiness, but when it comes to black girls in literature who are making morally questionable messy decisions, white readers are quick to tear those books and those authors to shreds and it just 
disgusts me every time. You have Luster, uh, which is about a chronically ill black woman who is in a terrible financial position. You have Happily Ever Afters, which is about a black girl in high school who is being, who falls in love with a boy that her white female bully is dating. This girl treats her like shit, makes her feel ugly about her looks, and white readers are out here concerned about the fact that she's out here trying to steal her boyfriend. And then you have Queenie, who is a black British Jamaican full-figured girl who is dealing with mental illness and sexual trauma, who is constantly shamed for her sexual exploits and the kind of the fact that she's sleeping with a married man. I just, I have never heard a valid criticism of Queenie that wasn't rooted in shaming her hypersexualization and not acknowledging the, the fact that she has an untreated sex addiction and also acknowledging the way that sexual assault and sexual traumatic abuse can make a person, especially a black woman, be hypersexual as a response. And I say black women especially because if you've studied psychology, I have a degree, you will know that different races respond to trauma differently. For example, Japanese people are more likely to experience symptoms of their mental illnesses through somatic symptoms. And that is less common for folks in America. That is just one example. And a lot of times the way that black women process their sexual trauma is by becoming hypersexual. The representation of that was so phenomenal and so well done. It's the same with Patsy. Patsy, again, deep sexual trauma, and she is a black character, a black female queer character who is constantly shredded for her sexual morality or immorality, as some would say. We also have the same thing in Felix Ever After, who was bullied by a white person, and he decides to go on this revenge campaign and does all of these immoral shit to get back at the boy who outed him, posted his uh, pre-transition photos everywhere all over the school and like his old, his dead name, all of that shit. And there's just no empathy at all for these characters. And I'm not saying that because you are marginalized or because you have trauma, your actions are always okay because that is the antithesis of this video. I'm saying give us our fucking nuance. If you're going to critique these black girls, these queer black people, these black boys, for the immoral, uh, morally gray decisions that they've made. I also wanna hear you talking about in that same exact breath, the ways that racism, structural oppression, and trauma have caused them to make those decisions. That's what I'm trying to say. Give us our fucking nuance because I am so sick and tired of seeing white reviewers rob black readers and black characters of their humanity. We deserve to be depicted in our entirety as dynamic human beings that have trauma responses, that sometimes make mistakes, that deserve to grow, that are imperfect. And so I hope all of this makes sense. I'm not saying throw these authors away. Don't get me wrong. Homeboy who wrote The Ancient Nine, he can get thrown away. Fuck that dude. For the most part, what I'm saying is keep reading these books, check out these authors, give them a second chance when their next book comes out. But know these criticism going in, use that criticism to acknowledge the fact that these are human beings who make mistakes. And I want you to give black authors the same second, third, fifth, five, six, seventh, eight, nine hundred chances that you give problematic white authors like Donna Tartt, Taylor Jenkins Reid, Orson Scott Card, Brandon Sanderson, Patrick Rothfuss, all of that shit. That is gonna do it for this video, I'm sure. That I I pissed a lot of you off. I just really wanted to have this conversation. I don't think I phrased everything perfectly, so I'm really looking forward to y'all's comments because every time I make a video like this, there are people within the comments who phrase what I'm trying to say better. And I'm like, yes, that was the point I'm trying to make. So I'm really looking forward to that. Especially having conversations about Light Seekers by Femi Coyote. Do it for this video if you want more content from me. I do have a Patreon, exclusive content for my wonderful patrons only. And all my social media links are linked down below as well. There's also links to recent popular videos that I've done and my most popular videos of all time. So feel free to just check shit out. My socials have changed from 
from Bow Ties and Books to Jesse on YouTube. So if you are watching any of my older videos and you go to any of those links and they don't work, if the link says Bow Ties and Books, it's old. So Jesse on YouTube, on YouTube obviously, and then on Instagram, it's Jesse on YouTube with an underscore. I also have a non-binary book club. It is NB Book Club on Instagram. Check that out if you want to read more books by non-binary authors. Don't forget to subscribe to Jonathan of To Be Black and Loved. He is just an amazing, tender, black, queer academic and his videos brighten up my day every single time. Thank you again. I hope that y'all are having an amazing day or evening wherever you are and I hope to see you in my next video.